Um, my name is Reza, and I'm a developer advocate at Tigera, um, the company behind Project Calico. Um, today, I'm going to talk about eBPF, um, specifically XDP programs, and how we could use them to uh, achieve a um, better result for applications that require high connection or extreme high connections. Um, things like memcached Redis um, comes to mind. Um, so why this? Um, if you're been paying attention to where the um, IT um, sphere is going, um, we are using a lot of AIs and we have been seeing a lot of AIs that sort of require that um, in-memory database to store uh, maybe some sort of credentials or I don't know, some sort of um, data. So in this scenarios uh, where you have a lot of requests that are coming to an application, um, well, you could use XDP to um, sort of have more efficient pathway and um, utilize more uh, with what you have in terms of resources. So for this uh, recording, I'm going to go through uh, one of the tutorials that we have in our website. So if you want to give it a try on your own, just go to tigera.io slash tutorials and check out the Calico eBPF and XDP uh, workshop. Now, um, the workshop starts uh, with a couple of things. So first of all, on the left side, I do have a console. Um, this is a live console and there is a Kubernetes cluster with two nodes in it. Um, but there are a couple of things that are not working in this cluster and we need to fix it uh, before getting to the XDP part. So these are the steps or um, understandings that we need before jumping into XDP. So first of all, um, let's take a closer look at uh, this cluster. Um, as you can see, um, my nodes are ready, but in my cube system, there are a couple of pods that are either crashing or not running properly. Um, if you look at all the pods, you can see a bunch of pods are running and a bunch of them are not. So why is that? Um, uh, if we look closer, um, we could check the IP poles. So um, Calico, when it's installed, it could uh, play a role of a CNI, a policy engine, or it could do everything all together and uh, even dish out IP addresses to your workloads and pods. So here in this workshop, we are using Calico as uh, the IP pool, as the IP address management system. So as you can see um, at the moment, um, Calico is using the CIDR of 192.168.00/16 to give IP address to our workloads and pods. Now there are a couple of other things that are um, worth mentioning here. One is NAT outgoing. So every pod that I create in this environment would. Um, go to internet or access external resources uh, that are not part of a cluster by getting natted to the uh, participating node or its local node. So let's say I've got a pod at um, one of my nodes, um, let's say node one. 
So whenever that pod wants to access something outside of the cluster, it will get source netted to the IP address of that node. Now, one more thing. So we talked about what is happening when um, it wants to access something external. Now, what happens if it wants to access something that is inside the cluster? Well, for that, we are using an encapsulation. Uh, to be specific here, we are using VXLAN. You can either use IPIP or VXLAN. Now, encapsulation should be used whenever you are in some sort of cloud provider or in an environment that you are not in charge of the networking, like the underlying networking. Um, usually in these cases, um, your nodes are connected to a default gateway. And that default gateway has no idea about the internal IP addresses that you are using for your workloads or your cluster. So um, to be to give you a better idea, so here my gateway, um, a gateway that my nodes are talking to is in the range of 10.5.0.0 10 slash, I guess, 24 or it could be 32. So this gateway has no idea about 192.168.0.0, which is my pods, my workloads that are inside of my cluster. So any packets that are trying to go from one pod in uh, node one to the other pod in node two, uh, it will get dropped because the default gateway has no address, that has no idea about that IP address or that CIDR. In order to uh, fix this issue, we cloak our packets or our traffic with an encapsulation, um, weak slant to be specific for this scenario. Let's go ahead and check which data plane is in work. So at the moment, um, this cluster is using IP tables data plane. IP tables data plane is, um, is dependent on the cube proxy. And if we look at the pods that we have, there is no cube proxy to be found. Now, that is happening because this particular environment is running without cube proxy. Um, why is that? So when you're using the eBPF data plane, you can basically just get rid of cube proxy because um, Calico eBPF data plane will completely replace the uh, cube proxy part. So everything would be programmed by eBPF data plane. Now, one thing that is worth mentioning here is when you don't have a cube proxy, um, stuff in your uh, cluster will not work. As you saw, those uh, three pods. There's also this particular service, Kubernetes service, which most programs use to communicate with Kubernetes API server. Now, given that we don't have cube proxy, Calico will not be able to communicate with Kubernetes API server. To fix that issue, we need to create an endpoint or a config map. So this config map is uh, in Tigera operator namespace, and it has the Kubernetes service endpoint. Basically, it just says, whenever you want to talk to Kubernetes API server, go to this host 
and this particular po uh, port. After you create this, all you need to do is to use your favorite um, editor and patch the um, operator installation and change the Linux data plane. So here I'm using a patch statement uh, because I like difficult things, but an easier approach would be if you edit installation and just here change this Linux data plane to BPF. Um, there are other um, data planes that you can use, uh, VPP, um, BPF, and uh, IP tables, and NF tables uh, this month, I hope so, with the next release, but we'll see anyway. Um, so this is one of the huge things about Calico. It has a pluggable data plane. So you basically can just check a data plane, see if it works for you. Uh, if the performance is what you need. If not, you could change to another data plane, give that a spin and see how it will work in your environment for your specific use case. Now, whenever you do anything to Calico or its configurations, in order to check if it's running okay or not, you could check the Tiger status subcommand. So here it will give you an indication of what is going on with Calico component. So at the moment, uh, we changed our um, data plane. And as you can see, 39 seconds ago, Calico was restarted and now it's available. Now, in some cases, um, you might run into some issue that you have no idea how to fix or no idea where to look for, who's for fixing it. For that, you could check the um, Calico node uh, container and get the logs from there. So here, for instance, I um, enabled BPF or eBPF. Now, in order to see if that worked, all I need to do is just uh, look at the logs for my Calico node and check what is happening with BPF. As you can see, BPF is enabled and it's actually doing the stuff that it needs to do. In some cases, um, you might not be able to disable kube proxy. So at the moment, I have full control over this workshop and everything in it. So if I want to enable queue proxy, I can just get rid of that disable queue proxy. But um, in some cases, uh, for instance, um, if I'm not allowed to restart this cluster or um, I cannot um, disable queue proxy because it's baked into the um, uh, distribution, for instance, Rancher or uh, some other distribution. Anyway, in those cases, um, queue proxy will be running and you have changed your Calico data plane to, let's say, eBPF. Now, queue proxy will try to run or deploy IP table rules. And Calico eBPF will try to deploy eBPF programs and flush the data plane, uh, flush the IP table um, list. Now, what will happen here is Kube proxy will check, see, oh, where are my rules? They're not here, deploy them. And eBPF will check it and goes like, who's like, running these sort of IP table things and get rid of it. So that cycle will never end. In those cases, what you can do is you can uh, patch one of the Felix configurations, which is called BPFQ proxy IP tables cleanup enabled. Should have been shorter. And um, change that to false. So 
Basically, you're telling Felix, the brain of Calico, that I'm going to use BPF, but please do not clean up the IP table rules that are inside my cluster or inside my IP tables. After that, you should be able to go to the next module. So here we learned about eBPF. Now, why that is significant, it's because XDP programs are actually BPF uh, based. Now, now that we know how to enable the eBPF data plane, um, let's go ahead and figure out how to write a policy. So policies are actually the way that we can tell Calico where we need the XDP hooks to be uh, deployed. So first of all, um, for this module, we have a simple shiny web page. Um, it communicates with the internet. You can click on let's try again and it will check the internet. Now, uh, when I say check the internet, it just cr uh, curls a website. I'm assuming it's example.com or something. Anyway, so if this pod can communicate with that server, it will tell us there is internet. Now, why is that significant? Um, when you install any sort of CNI or any sort of policy engine, the default behavior is to permit everything. Basically, the policy for Kubernetes is permit everything unless you are writing a policy. Now, for the most part, you can do a lot with a policy engine and Kubernetes network policy. However, if you want to, for instance, write a policy that uh, applies to all the namespaces, well, that is some sort of difficult thing to achieve because um, Kubernetes, name is, uh, Kubernetes policies are namespaced and you need to create the namespace first in order to create the policy. See where I'm getting at? So um, now Calico provides um, two unique policy resources, Calico Network Policy and uh, Calico Global Network Policy that give you a lot more than what is what you can achieve with uh, Kubernetes Network Policies. For instance, if I want my cluster to have some sort of baseline security. I don't want it. I don't want any of my pods to be able to reach the internet. And um, I don't want to disable that NAT out going either. So what I can do is I can write a default policy. Now, my default policy is going to be a global network policy because I don't want to go and write policy for every namespace. What I can do is I can use a global network policy and in there I can say whatever comes into my cluster should be denied. As you can see, there is an ingress without any uh, specifications that means to match everything. And unless my pods are trying to uh, communicate with a destination that has a selector of cube DNS, which is my core DNS pods and on port 53 protocol UDP, deny them all. So after this point, if we try again, this should fail. All right, so while it is failing, we can come and talk about something else. Now, 
Um, one more thing to note here is um, this web page is actually accessed by a service and uh, it's a load balancer service. So in that case, this whole web page will not work either because there is this ingress clause in my policy. If you remember, I talked about when there is no policy or in the absence of any policies, everything is permitted. But the minute that you write a policy, everything is denied unless it is specified. So I'm going to write another policy which specifically says if there is a traffic and it's going for that web container application, let it flow. So now my web page opens up and my workload has no access to the internet. So now that we know how to write policies, um, we're going to use the Calico policies to actually write some XDP programs. Now, these XDP programs will um, allow stuff to not go into the Linux contract table. Why is that significant? Um, so this demo is with Redis. Um, Redis creates a bunch of short-lived connections and a huge number of them, which can easily overwhelm uh, the contract table. Now, in a real world, you will have a Redis cluster with like 10 or maybe more um, servers. But again, with all of them, there is that limited number of contract um, records that you can accept in your servers. So um, let's get started. Um, this demo, uh, there's a Prometheus that allows us to check uh, the contract entries. Um, this is basically my nodes, uh, node one and node two. And we're basically just checking how many contract uh, entries are in these nodes. So first, let's create a Redis server. Um, nothing extraordinary. We're just uh, telling the deployment to happen on my node two. Uh, uh, just to refresh your memory, we're using two nodes. Uh, we're deploying this on node two. And now we're going to use my first node or node one to run a benchmark application. Now, uh, Redis benchmark comes with Redis and it's a great utility to, you know, run tests on your Redis cluster. So again, I'm going to say for this deployment, use node one. I'm going to run the benchmark. Hopefully it will succeed. All right, stuff happening. So now if we come back to Prometheus and fresh, you can see there is a huge uh, number of entries that are created in one of the nodes. If you wait, the other one will have the same faith. And this will continue until the um, contract or uh, until the benchmark ends. So basically, each one of these um, benchmark creates number of requests, which is something that happens in a real life scenario. Um, your application or your users will create requests. And as 
but for instance if there is a if there's an event that you're selling goods or doing stuff which uh, a lot of customers try to access your services then you would run into the issue of contract table or load balancing and those sort of stuff so um next we can take a look at a contract so my first node at the moment has 238 contract um, this is basically what we are what we can see here so um, 257 it will change um, but again uh, it's the number of entries in the contract now in order to use xdp or to enable xdp first we need to create a host endpoint now a host endpoint is a special resource that allows you to bring an interface or a non-namespaced uh, resource it allows you to use labels to refer to that non-namespaced uh, resource, which is something that you cannot do with Kubernetes network policies. For instance, you cannot say, oh, things that are flowing from this interface. So basically, we are just creating a resource, a host endpoint resource, and we are saying this host endpoint will be a name or a dangling point for our uh, interface ENS4 and whenever we want to use it we are going to use label HEP. Now um, we can use a couple of things um, to write our policy uh, first of all, I'm going to empty the uh, contract table so we have a better sort of view in our Prometheus. And I'm also going to create a global network policy to allow a couple of um, ports that are crucial for um, this test to be allowed inside. Remember, we created a host endpoint policy. The host endpoint policy had the label HEP and it had the value Redis host. Next, what we're going to do is, uh, oh, by the way, I've been talking about the contract uh, limit. So you can check that in the Proxys net and NF contract max. It's the number you, uh, it's the number of contract that is allowed in your system. You can adjust it, um, take it higher or uh, make it lower. It depends on your scenario. But if you do the things that we are talking about here, that shouldn't be an issue anymore. Anyway, so now that we have our uh, stuff there, in order to enable XDP, we create a global network policy with two distinct features. One is apply and forward is true. The other one is do not track is true. So basically, we are telling Calico that I want this policy to disable contract for this communication. Now, since we are disabling contract, Linux will go back to its default mode, which is by default, Linux is stateless. Contract is the thing or it's the program that is making it stateful by remembering where a traffic was originated. And if there is a response to a flow where it should be go. So Basically, we're telling, I don't want contract. So if you receive something 
from uh, let's say port 6379 then make sure to send it back on port 6379 after this we can run our uh, benchmark again so remember uh, in in the previous testing if we there was this mountain that we created and we're hoping we don't see this mountain again now let me change this all right so both nodes are telling me their contract number and now i'm gonna run the benchmark uh, this is usually where things don't work out so let's check as you can see um one of the nodes is around three thousand contract entries but the other one is just chilling at 300. so basically uh, we achieved what we wanted to do and as you can see stuff are happening a lot faster again um because we're using xdp we are completely bypassing the um uh, linux networking stack so everything just comes to xdp and with a ebpf program it figures out where it needs to go and it gets to the point that it needs to be as you can see again throughout the benchmark one of the nodes is scoring a lot of contract record records but the other one is just chilling at 300. and that's about it um as a um just to read just to remind you if you would like to run this experiment or workshop on your own uh, come to tigera.io slash tutorials um, there are a lot of tutorials in there just spin them um, check which one is the one that you're looking for if you want to see a workshop a specific workshop um, send us an email or a message we'll be happy to create that one as well stuff are written here you can uh, use our slack channel to communicate with us uh, we got x twitter whatever it's called these days and uh, our main source of truth which is github with that um, i hope you liked this uh, recording and see you later